the end of my last talk, I described Perry's, uh, Faraday's idea of a magnetic field. How the presence of the magnet made a difference in the space of round, which gave us magnetic effects. And how we could map out the direction of the force, the magnetic force, by the lines along which a compass sets itself by means of these filings. I've just tapped the filings again, and you can see this Faraday field around the magnet here in the middle. Now, I don't know whether you get the impression that these lines are not starting from each end and running round. They are running round and then diving into the magnet and running round again. And that's the right impression you ought to get. This field runs round like that and round like that into the magnet again. This is rather like, they always look to me rather like traffic lines. You could imagine this is lines of traffic out in the open and this is a kind of underpass like you have at Hyde Park Corner where the, tra where the traffic dives in and goes into the iron and then comes out again at the other end. Well, I want to show you that, that there really is a field inside the iron as well as in the space outside it. I'm going to do that with a saw blade here. That saw blade is at the moment not magnetic. If I take it and dip it into these little iron filings, you'll see it's quite unmagnetic. But in a nice way we can do with magnets, I'll turn that into a magnet just by stroking it once like this with a powerful magnet. You'll see a little bit later on that turns the, why that turns that into a magnet. Now here we are, do you see? It now has become a magnet. Each end is magnetic. There is the other end, that's magnetic too. But there's nothing in the middle. It's quite inert there, do you see? It's quite inert. But this is, it is really there, but the lines of force are inside. Because if I take that saw blade and snap it in two, you see a magnet, a magnet. The lines of force are coming out into the open now and showing us they were really there inside the whole time. Well now, so far we've been talking about magnets and we've mentioned the lodestone and I've used other magnets here. But we must remember that when this all started, there really was no way of getting at all a strong magnet. Lodestones are quite feeble magnets. One could make a piece of steel into a magnet by stroking it with a lodestone, like I did that saw blade, but it was a very feeble magnet when that was done. And it was a very great discovery in the history of magnetism when, for the first time, it was found out by Ersted early in the 19th century that you could make a magnetic field with an electric current. That the flowing of a current along a wire made a magnetic field in its neighborhood, a new way of making a magnetic field. Ersted's experiment we've got rigged up here. He showed, this was his great discovery, that if you have a wire along which a current can be sent and a compass needle just under the wire, that when one switches on and sends a current along this wire, it tends to drive the North Pole, the Red Pole, in one direction and the other South Pole in the opposite direction. In fact, to, to twist the magnet round so it tries to sort of set itself at right angles to the wire. Now, Mr. Coates will switch the current on and you'll see the magnet trying to set itself. We'll steady it again. Switch the current on again. There you see how it, how it, how it switches round. The current obviously makes a magnetic field there pushing this pole this way. So in that way, we create a magnetic field by means of a current. Now, perhaps you can see that if a current running along here pushes that North Pole that way, it'll try to push it this way and this way and this way by symmetry around that wire. So it was soon realized that the way to get a really strong magnetic field was to send a current round and round a wire. Suppose you take a piece of iron like this and wrap a wire around it. Then you see the current running along here will tend to make magnetic field that way, just as it did in the Ersted experiment. The current running along here will do the same thing. The current running along here will do the same thing, and so on. So all the current around all these turns of wire tends to make a magnetic field the same way. Here you see this piece of iron is quite unmagnetic. If I dip it in that pot of nails, absolutely nothing happens. 
And now if I ask Mr. Coates to send a current around the wire, you see the result? It picks up quite a lot of the nails. Turn the current off, and down all the nails go, except for a little magnetism left in the iron. We'll see why that's so uh, presently. So, Erste's discovery made it possible to make really strong magnets for the first time by sending electric currents round coils of wire having iron in the middle. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, a very tiny magnet of that kind. Uh, it, this magnet is hanging up here on this gantry. It's, the wire runs round and round in a coil. Outside is a kind of shell of iron and there's a piece of iron in the middle. Now, we've got a little keeper, Mr. Coates has here, which you see isn't attracted at all. But if we send a current around that wire, we'll make the central piece of iron into a magnet, and it'll hold on its little keeper. This dry battery is all I need to send enough current along, and you'll see it then becomes a very strong magnet indeed. Now, first of all, I'm not sending the current through. You'll see there's no stiction at all. But now, if I connect this on and send the current through it, has really made it into quite a strong little magnet. Watch my assistant now. And now when he says off, I'll turn off the current. Off. We've said a piece of iron, we say a piece of iron is attracted by a magnet. Thinking of it in terms of a field, what we really ought to say is a piece of iron tries to go from a place where the field is weak to a place where the field is strong. Now here again is one of these solenoids, these coils to which we can send a current. Here is a piece of iron at the bottom here. It's resting on the table. But if my assistant switches on the current, you'll see that iron try to get into the strong field. On, off. On, off. So that's the right way to think magnetic attraction. Finally, as you saw when I stroked a piece of iron, a piece of iron can be a magnet or not. This piece of iron is quite inert. It doesn't pick up any nails at all. But if I just stroke it with a magnet, once like that is enough to turn it into quite a strong magnet. Now here I've got what we call our magic pot. And we can make a piece of iron into a magnet or not a magnet in that pot as we like. To show how easy it is for iron to be in either state. Shall we have a magnet first? You see, it's quite a strong magnet. Now, please, we'll have not a magnet. Nothing, you see. A magnet again. And not a magnet. Inert. Now I'm going to plunge around more deeply into the inner structure of the iron and think why we see all these effects. I start the lectures by saying a magnet is a magnet because it's made of little magnets, and that is literally true. In iron, which is of course built of atoms, every atom is a small magnet. And we can get a good deal further if we think of this structure. These little magnets influence each other. And in fact, in the iron, they all group themselves into families, what we call domains, uh, little areas in the iron, inside each of which the magnets are head to tail, north to south, all pointing the same way. And we can understand this and how it affects the behavior of the iron by a model. I'm going to show you now quite a famous model, the Ewing model. The Ewing model, I've got one here, is a lot of little compass needles, all pivoted so they can turn around freely. They're all magnetized north and south. They've got little arrows, white arrows, at their north ends. Now, if you leave such a model like this alone, give it a stir up and let it settle down by itself, you will see how these little magnets break up into domains, just like we're supposing our iron to do. For instance, all the little magnets there are pointing this way. All those there are pointing that way. Here is a little family pointing that way. And there's a little family over there pointing that way. And that tells us once what the difference is between a piece of iron 
when it's a magnet, and a piece of iron when it's not a magnet. You saw that we could turn from one to the other quite easily. <coughs> if we put the iron in a magnetic field, we say it magnetizes it. What does it do? The field from the magnet makes all these little magnets turn round and point the same way. And then the iron, of course, will behave as if it were a magnet. I've got such a magnet here, and I'll slowly approach it to this. You see these little fellows begin to get lively, and as it were, think better of it, they must do something about it. And as I get it closer and closer, it will make them all point in the same direction. Do you see them now? All now I've magnetized that arm, as we say. We've turned it into a magnet by putting it in a magnetic field. If I alter that field, which I can do by turning this magnet round, you'll see they get unhappy again. They're trying to follow the new direction of the field. When I turned it quite round, they'll all reverse direction and try and point the opposite way to what they were doing before. There, 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 they're doing it, you see. So that is an explanation of the way in which magnetic field turns a piece of iron into a magnet. Now you may have noticed when I turned that round, they were sort of sticky. They didn't all do what they were supposed to do at once. And that was because uh, there's a certain friction, as it were, in the magnets turning round. We can help that friction by giving them a bit of a knock, by jigging them, so to speak, and help them to make up their minds. And I have here uh, quite a well-known experiment, always known as the poker experiment, just to show that if we give these little magnets a chance to orientate themselves by giving them a little movement, how quite a weak field is able to turn them round and make them all point the same way. Here is our compass needle. Here is an ordinary poker, which we've carefully demagnetized. Now, if I approach the end of that poker to either pole of this compass, it will attract, because the compass is a little bit magnetic, you see, and it tends to attract it. Same way that end there. It tracks them, either end attracts the north towards it, you see. Because the magnet of the compass is pulled towards the iron of the poker. Now, if I take this poker, place it in the direction of the Earth's field, which is trying to pull its little magnets around, but is very, very weak indeed. If I give it a hearty bang, now I hope we'll see we've turned this into a magnet. And where before it attracted the pole, now it repels it, do you see? pushes it away. So we've made this a magnet simply by giving it a hearty knock with the hammer. Here is a very extraordinary body. Um, this body here is what we call permaloy. And this uh, permaloy is so soft that we don't even have to give it a hit. It's made to turn each other round just in the Earth's field. I'll hold it first of all at right angles to the Earth's field, and we'll take our magnet right away, and then you will see it's quite non-magnetic. Uh, these little magnets here really don't take any notes of it as I move it about. But now, if I hold it so that it's pointing in the direction of the Earth's field, which is about this here, now do you see they're all quite excited. I've simply made it a magnet by turning it round to the Earth's field, and made it a magnet again by simply putting it at right angles to the Earth's field there, do you see? It's as soft as that. So in a body like this, the little magnets can turn around very easily, and we call it very soft magnetically. At the other hand, there's the bodies of which we make our permanent magnets. Now there, these little compass needles these atomic magnets are very hard to turn round. There's a great deal of friction. But once they're turned, it's very hard to turn them back again. So if you put on a big magnetic field and then take it away, it remains a strong magnet. We've got one of those really strong magnets here. We'll hang it up by its keeper on a gantry. <coughs> and you will see it will stand quite a weight. And now, just to show that there's no cheating about it, uh, Mr. Coates will wrench off its keeper. I want you to make sure it really isn't fixed on. There it is, you see. There is the keeper of this strong magnet. 
Well, I'll end with what I began with. Uh, a magnet is a magnet, because it's made of little magnets. And I think you'll realize, if we think of it in that way, then we have a much better understanding of the way magnets work.